this is a great, great uh, opportunity for us to be here. It's an honor and pleasure to share with you about some stories that we believe is going to be significant, whether coming from my country or globally. Uh, I would like to introduce myself by saying that I'm an international student coming originally from a country called Iraq. I'm going to talk about this country in a moment. Um, I have been selected uh, by my government who sent me to finish my PhD in nursing education since we believe that the new Iraq really needs this, this, this element to uh, reform, to revitalize the damaged uh, life in terms of dictatorship moving to democracy. So the new government in my country believes in education as a the ultimate solution to what's going on in my country. The tragedies that we moved through, I believe that you heard some about uh, these issues. And uh, I'm a full-time faculty member at University of Baghdad. This is the capital city and this is the largest university in my country and it's considered one of the largest universities in the entire Middle East. And uh, yes, I believe I'm lucky that I, I submitted my work papers and uh, ac uh, according to the criteria and eligibility for scholarship programs, I was selected and then my government uh, looked for universities in, the, in this great developed country and uh, they found that OCU, Oklahoma City University, is uh, the best place to get PhD in nursing education. Uh, my family is here with me, and uh, I'm almost done, almost done. <laughs> it's, it's really helpful to think that, uh, actually it's a journey, learning education is a journey for me, and I learned a lot from being here with, with American friend and student, trying to share about things that we have in common. So that's me, and uh, it's an honor and, and pleasure to be here with you today to share about our topic here, and I will let the, uh, the stage for Haider to talk about himself, and then we are going to start. Good morning. My name is Haider al Hadraoui. I'm from Iraq. I live, I, I'm from Iraq. I live about 120 miles south of capital city, Baghdad. Uh, I finished my bachelor degree. In fact, my journey in nursing started from the high school of nursing. Then I moved to the diploma after diploma, B, uh, you know, bachelor after bachelor, uh, master, yeah, master degree <coughs> in psychiatric nursing. Then now I'm in my third year of PhD program. Uh, my clinical background was in psychiatric nursing. I worked about eight years as a bedside nurse and nurse educator. I assumed uh, different leadership positions inside the Ministry of Health. Then I moved in 2009, I moved to be a fac uh, full-time faculty member at the University of Babylon <coughs> College of Nursing. I thought because our university was uh, newly created, I had to teach different courses just to get, you know, to get something done. Then for the scholarship, my friend talks about the scholarship, in fact, there is a new program uh, created in 2009 called uh, the, uh, the, higher education the, higher the Higher Education Committee for Education Development in Iraq, which is related to the Prime Minister Office. It's not related to the, for, we don't see people, we apply online. We have 18, uh, you call it state, you call it a province, 18 province in Iraq. They give a certain scholarship number for each province, and we had to compete on these. So for my province, we are about 2,500,000 2 people. We had to compete on 25 scholarship seats. So finally, and thankfully, I get one. So now I'm here for my scholarship to get my PhD program. I'll be finished in December 2015, thanks. Thanks, guys. So, I believe that we are going to start with the reason that we are here together. Uh, I would start from the beginning, which is uh, our title here. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there is uh, hundreds of stories behind this title. And 
I believe that there is no time to share about all these stories. Uh, but we believe that this, this title is a good frame that represents what's going on in the entire Middle East and especially in this place that I'm, I'm coming from. And uh, today I would like to start with saying that the allocated time for sharing about our guest here today, I would like to s describe it as a guest, is not really enough since our guest here today that I'm going to share a story about it is considered as a, the cradle of civilization, the earliest form of civilization found there. And uh, its soil has witnessed the earliest form of civilization, civil society, constitutional laws, and agriculture. This place that I'm coming from <coughs> is called Mesopotamia, that's the ancient historical name. And the land of this special guest uh, witnessed the birth of the earliest form of uh, constitutional laws. We introduced law to the world, it's called the Stilet of Hammurabi. And this is just samples of uh, its ancient architect, and as you can see here, it's the uh, winged ox and shown the fight for survival in this great land and this place called Iraq. So many things going on there. It's a story, a long story actually. Uh, Baghdad, that's the place that, we're, that I come from and in terms of geography I just want to share about uh, my country uh, as you can see here, the, uh, our neighbors here come uh, the northern part, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, and Iran. We live in this special place where so many things going on until the moment. Our learning outcomes today uh, at the end of this, this simple presentation, I would like you to live the experience that we Iraqi nurses lived and still at the moment living inside what I'm going to describe it in a moment and Haider also going to tell you about the realities about this place in terms of nursing and healthcare providers like you people believe me are going to change the world by your degrees and your willingness to help people but we have a special situation at this special part of the wall, which is Iraq. And we believe that the post-traumatic stress disorder that we have in, 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 let's say, the national version of this, this disorder is kind of different from the international version. We believe that our version of post-traumatic stress is different than the international version. And we are going to prove that by research and uh, our observation from uh, the uh, uh, violence realities. In fact, modern Iraq is the natural extension of the ancient Iraq. And uh, here's the hanged paradise. This is a, a historical landmark uh, where Haider, my friend, worked. It's called Babylon. Uh, it's, it's, it's the earliest form of uh, uh, complicated architect where the ba Babylonians start uh, this, 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 this figures in terms of civilization and uh, there is a, a bridges between the ancient history and the modern era in terms of peace, harmony and love. That's the capital city of my uh, country. Uh, I I use, uh, actually, uh, the, 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 the building the, uh, beside the tallest building, that's the College of Nursing. And uh, there also the medical city that we used to work there. And uh, here's just landmark of my city. Unfortunately, there is always however. And after however, there are so many tragedies. This is tr uh, unfortunate fact. During the last... Uh, th um, Decades, actually, my country have been 
moved through three international wars and 13 economic sanction years and dictatorship and foreign occupations and most importantly, terrorism. That's something imposed on us. And here's just just simple uh, selected picture of the, the huge impact of what's going on in my country. Um, I'm not saying that the entire country is infected with this lesion, but I'm saying that we are extremely affected by those criminal minds, those terrorists who are trying to destroy the uh, civil society by their bombed ideology. So as you can see, who is the uh, victims here? Innocent. They don't care. Here's a new chapter of uh, uh, violence in my country. Uh, uh, as you can see, here's innocent people <coughs> killed by what they so-called themselves as Islamic State. They are way of this description. So they kill people just, just because they don't agree with them. So if you, are, if you don't agree with me, I'm going to finish your life and that's it. Simply like that. Those extremists, even Al-Qaeda couldn't handle them. So now even Al-Qaeda with, with their bombed ideology, with their extreme uh, thinking, they don't even handle them. The new generation of Al-Qaeda call themselves so-called uh, ISIS. So this is a new chapter. I actually start about five months ago and uh, take control of uh, a significant percentage of uh, Iraq, especially at the uh, northern part. Not, not actually northern part, at the uh, uh, eastern part. Uh, by the way, actually, uh, these are real pictures. Uh, that's the place where we're used affected by this, this war between us and terrorism. And this exact scene at the place that I used to work, uh, doing my uh, job as a faculty at the University of Baghdad, College of Nursing, that's, that's crying face, it are the usual scene that I'm used to see it every day. By the way, we live where this is a, a new I would like to say a new trend. Uh, the trauma affect the uh, the way we live our life. It's interfere with the social connection and it's affect the mentality of children, which is serious. As you can see, here's the uh, Iraqi children playing with coffins, trying to represent what's going on there, because death is the usual scene every day. So they are trying to simulate what's going on there by having fun. Here's uh, another orphan playing over the grave of his sister. Here's another serious issue here. Iraqi uh, children affected by the continuous trauma and violence, trying to have fun. This is the kind of uh, new developed uh, playing, as you can see, which is indicate something happening there. Here's another simple picture showing uh, st uh, Iraqi children trying to having fun by imitating the adults having this conflict all the time. And we live where I will let the picture speak. Really unfortunate. That's that's our daily life in terms of healthcare providing. And uh, the mass casualty is the norm every single day, especially at the hot spot. One of these spots, Baghdad, the capital city, that's the usual scene every day, unfortunately. We are trying to control it, however, those people are fighting back. So uh, I would like to show you a, a video here, uh, if I manage to activate it, here is a, a chapter of violence inside a, um, an emergency room, where as you can see here, violence between uh, victims and their families, 
and nurses are trapped there trying to control the situation which is almost impossible without interference of police so this is just just simple thing in terms of violence and how it's affect our life in terms of health care providing a friend of mine sent this to me recently so I decided let's let's share it with with colleagues and friends to let them see what what violence and trauma can cause in terms of controlling the healthcare environment and uh, I would like to share about this scenario which is a real scenario uh, I would love to call it uh, as a tornado scenario here uh, uh, in fact I was talking with a, with an American friend she's she's a very respectful lady with in our program after the uh, after we finished the class that was I believe two years ago when uh, when the tornado of Moore, we were we were there, and it was really intimidating. It was really horrible experience. You know the nature and its effect on human beings. It was the first time I see it. So we were having this conversation after the class, and uh, this lady told me sh she was talking to us. She said, "I expect that the suicide rate will increase significantly in Oklahoma due to the." the devastation and the effect of tornado. And that, that segment in her speech stopped me for a while and I talked with her and I said, well, uh, I really invite you to think about this. What if, what if, God forbid it, Oklahoma suffered a tornado every day? She stopped for a while and then, let me think. She said, let me think. What if the tornado hit the, the, uh, the human beings living here every single day, what, that, what kind of life that this great society will have? So we live the tornado every single day back there in, in my country. So what if the exception becomes the norm? These are some question marks I would like if we have time. Uh, to share about your ideas about this, how do you feel about this? This is a, a real scenario. I have been <laughs> almost, it was near death experience for me. And in terms of body mass, I'm a big, big person, a big man. Uh, I was approaching toward the death without knowing. And there was a bomb car waiting for us, moving toward our uh, work. and. Uh, those criminals decided that we're, they are going to start the day with uh, with a, a bomb car. So they blow it up, and I was moving toward this 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 scene. And the explosion threw me away from the uh, explosion, and it was huge. And I saw the casualties, and I checked myself. And guess what? I went to my home. It was very close to the scene, and I checked my bruises. It was just just simple bruises and. I take care of it and then I changed my clothes and went back to my work to help people. And Haider actually will go to tell you about what are the motivators that motivate me to continue with my usual daily life routine. This is something we need to live with if I decided that I'm, that's my day stopped there, I'm not going back to my work, who's going to take care of people? So that's, that's something we believe that Iraqi nurses have to face. This is just in terms of uh, statistics. Uh, the Iraqi nurses statistics, as you can see here, the population of Iraq, has, this is huge, as you can see by comparing the number with the uh, population size. Very, very huge. I, I would like, I will, I will let the numbers talking about themselves. As you can see here, about that was in 2009. We had uh, about 37, 700 nurses in the entire country, providing care to about 30 million. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and, and then uh, about four years, five years later. Uh, 2013, the statistics. I mean, I believe it's increased significantly. We are trying to open new programs, 
uh, nursing, but still 60,000 and 33 million. Still, there's a huge gap here in terms of providing care. And uh, I would like to ask you to don't forget about the special circumstances that those 60,000 facing every single day. So here's another uh, comparison, as you can see here, the international version, uh, nurse population ratio, which is 8.4 for every 1,000 population. But as you can see here in Iraq, let me focus on, on 2013, 1.6 nurse for, <laughs> can you imagine that? What kind of care? We are trying to do our best, but that's the reality. That's another uh, special feature of Iraqi nursing version in terms of gender. Uh, the majority of uh, Iraqi nurses are male, and uh, about 25% all the female. We are trying to correct the equation here by uh, putting some kind of uh, incentives to invite female to join nursing. There are so many uh, hindrance in their way to join nursing. And uh, now we are trying to correct the situation here by uh, inviting uh, expertise uh, from outside the country and trying to add some invest investment in this side. In terms of nursing education and uh, in my country, uh, uh, we have different levels of uh, nursing, starting from high school up to until to uh, PhD in nursing. And uh, as you can see here, uh, BSN is the minority among Iraqi nurses. <laughs> can you imagine the number here? 2,500 uh, 2, out of 60,000. This is something we are trying to address. Uh, here is the uh, Iraqi Nursing Syndicate, the official representative of Iraqi nurses, trying to address the situation of Iraqi health care providers, nurses specifically, by offering scholarship and trying to upgrade the professional status of Iraqi nurses. I shared about this, this, this statistic just to show you uh, those 60,000 trying to survive, taking care of themselves and taking, their, and taking care of their people. But it's difficult. This is something I would like to share with you. The most painful kind of wounds are those deep and invisible. The hardest tears are those that we cry in silence those tears stream slowly and burn our souls. That's something from the critical situation from my experience. And uh, Haider is going to share with you how Iraqi nurses are finding a meaning in suffering. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an, an honor and pleasure to share culture of violence from the different, you know, the second part of the world, which is the special Middle East and particularly from Iraq. And Sadiq talks about the challenges that all the Iraqi nurses face, all, all the Iraqi people face, but it's imposed additional challenges or nurses because People can adapt something, for example, can adapt their life to protect themselves for just necessary things, while nurses are expected to work every day, and despite the challenges they face going and, going, going and coming from their home to their home, uh, they face uh, workplace violence to videotape something while there is an circumstances happen, because they see you like you are trying to publish them on Facebook or something. So it's really hard and it's opportunity to get a small picture or just a small video to show people that's what kind of violence that nurses face. In fact, what does this picture mean to you? When I just came, 
people show me the paramedic room and it was supportive for this picture. What does this picture mean to you? We usually ask a questions, or let me just explain. We usually care about patients, and all most of the research talking about how nurses can take care of patients during the violence or during their trauma. But here is the representative picture. It says this is during the CPR. So if the nurse or the rescuer is the victim, who is going to take care of the rest of the people? So from my perspective is if the nurses are affected by the violence, how they can provide a qualified care or competent care for people. So studies that's always talking about patients and the patients in the first rank, while nurses always, not always, let's say, most of the time ignored or maybe in this country or different countries, the violence or the type of the trauma on nurses is a little bit different, but in my beloved country, the trauma on nurses always extreme. Before I go ahead in my presentation, I have a couple stories to tell. In, 2000, in the end of 2005, uh, 2007, it was critical time that the people that Sadiq talked about during the marathon, it's a religious marathon where people walking to visit the whole places. And those people had the number of five to seven millions every year. It's a once, once time a year. So at that time, the, the extremists and the so-called themselves, uh, ISIS, they, their ideology is to take over the country and build a new country for themselves. They throw mortars on people, some of them, because it's on the bridge, some of them died sinking, and some of them died you know, by the shield from the uh, mortars. And I was working in the middle, uh, in the medical city, which is the biggest, middle, b biggest medical city in the entire Middle Eastern region, which contains about eight hospitals and different specialties, and each hospital more than 1,000 beds. Regarding the emergency units, and and even this medical city has the moving, uh, let's say, it's a something that we can walk on. It's not. It's a really big, we cannot walk from hospital. So we have a moving, uh, something we can go on. Brought them to the, the ambulances, brought them to the hospital because it's different specialties. And we were trying to manage at least those. We, have a, we had a triage nurse to see who's died and who's still alive, at least to, care, to take care of those. And we can at least to save their life. If 1,000 came to the hospital from our culture, imagine 5,000 comes with them. It's a very compound culture, and when you see 100 people running, that means someone needs help. This is our culture. And the people will uh, criticize you if you don't go with them and run, because the only way we can see people run, it's because someone needs help. So when you see 1,000, that means 5,000, additional 5,000 people comes to see, someone needs to see their relatives, someone to see their friends. So nurses at that time, usually physicians, and I hate to, to say that, physicians usually, usually when there is a, a big mass, uh, casualties, they leave the emergency room. But nurses are not. So you, at that time, you would face a challenges, which you, you you know, the physical injuries, people may hate you because everyone needs you to rescue their patients. So and imagine five or six, 10, let's say 50 nurses cannot manage 1,000. So one of the challenges, my friends, trying to move the dead bodies and to make a space for the injured people. And one of the dead bodies, he turned dead body, and the dead body was his, his father. I thought he, he would not continue. But in fact, because of the casualties, he was out of the control, and he just moved his father and turned back to work just to rescue people. And the second story was two extremist people trying to blow themselves up to kill people. One of them succeed, and the second one was shot. 
and the po police man brought him to the hospital because he was the only evidence that we, they can know who was behind them. Uh, we were in the emergency room, and in addition to those people who were trying to get you to rescue their victims, and the police were trying to keep us with the victims, with the, sorry, with the extremists, just to manage the extremists and maintain his life because they need to know who was behind them. That was just, not just a physical injuries of trauma and seeing these views of, views of the blood. There was an internal conflict. For me, I'm a human. I, for me, I can describe myself. I cannot manage the, uh, the guilty people or the extremists and leave the victims. At the same time, we were threatened by police if we leave the the extremists and go to work with the victims, that would be additional threat. And when the extremists died, they, they started to shoot in their guns inside the emergency room. So imagine, imagine yourself, afraid from the patient, from the, afraid from the relatives, seeing the separated part of the humans, someone lose his leg, uh, everything you can see in the emergency room. But imagine you're afraid of if the oxygen can always blow and kill so many people. So that's, create, that's the, the living under the threats of terrorism, wars, additional form of violence, impose the effects and the wounds on, on our spirituality and our uh, soul. So, but not all of these ones are visible. We can manage the visible ones, but the invisible ones, it's hard to be managed. One of these ones is the post-traumatic stress disorder. The PTSD, it's a form of an anxiety, and we want to share the PTSD because we are believe the version of Iraqi nurses experience the PTSD is totally different from what other nurses or other people can experience. And the way they deal with it, PTSD, it's totally different and they're going to share. For those who don't know what PTSD means, it's a form of anxiety, but this is requires the person to, to be in touch with the threats, life threats, and involve a, a tense of, of fear. <coughs> And studies have shown that this is the but this is the definition, and people have to experience or witnessing a very life-threatening situation because of PTSD. Other than that, it's going to be a stress symptoms. And why PTSD studies? In fact, in fact, we combined two studies: part from this study from the Middle Eastern region, and from the Western region. Studies in the Middle Eastern region shows that healthcare providers who work in the community that impacted by violence or war or trauma develop a PTSD, which is the most prevalence or the bigger prevalence of uh, psychiatric disorder. And studies in the Western shows that those who deployed to work in Iraq and Afghanistan and who face the trauma of war and violence also develop a BTSD. What's the dominant picture of BTSD? Here's one of the dominant pictures, which is people cannot express the positive actions, which is called emotional numbness. Second thing, it always makes you alert and worry for the danger. And this is the big form we always we don't know what's behind this wall. We walk, we go to work, we do everything, but we don't know what's behind this car, what's behind this person. This is the form of re-experiencing the, the trauma, which is called flashback. Here's a criteria for PTSD. It's the first one is to represent the definition to be witnessed or if I, for example, if I talk to you about PTSD, 
definitely you're not going to have a PTSD. You have to witness the, in, the action, the violence action, or at least intact with it. The second thing is the person responses involve intense fear. Not everyone have a PTSD. We experience the trauma, and we ex I experienced about seven years of the trauma. I live in Najaf, which is the most safe place in Iraq, but I worked in Baghdad. I worked in Baghdad city from 2001 to 2009. So I used to go every week and facing the, t the different type of trauma and stress, but not, every not everyone experienced the PTSD. The third thing is the symptoms occur after three months. It continue for three months because if it's just for the first month and you check it, it's not considered as a PTSD. But if it, with the symptoms, the intense fear, and these the flashback and the numbness, the emotional numbness, and an ability to express the positive action continue for three months or more than that's going to be definitely a PTSD. There's the same question, does anyone experience the PTSD? No. It's depend on the severity of the trauma, life experiences, and gender. Women, it's twice, about twice than men, and we're gonna show that's why. Here is what's different, we call the international version. Example that caused a PTSD in the entire world. We may affect it a bit, but we are a little bit different. The first one is the gen the disaster. This is really something really hard to to explain, but this is the reality. It's not happen everywhere and not not happen every day. But this is part from the nurses. I can expect this with me. It's not necessary to be happen, but I can expect it. One day, I worked, you know, I spent my, all my clinical, almost all my clinical backgrounds in the psychiatric unit, but there was a, called a renal unit when there's a dialysis close to the psychiatric units, and someone died. We heard like screaming and nurses need help. We went to help, and we found nurses in the corner and people trying to hurt all the nurses because their father or their mother died. But thankfully, my friend was a boxer, <laughs> and, they, and he was tall, and so people were afraid of this person, and they left. <coughs> so those nurses could be killed or injured. So imagine when we need some, when I was the director of the nursing edu continuous education, and we went, when we need nurses working in the dialysis, and no one accept to work, especially females. <clears throat> they all reject it, and they say if they were forced to work in the dialysis, they would leave the job. And it's easy, it's not like you, when you lose your job, it's hard to find another job. Our system is a governmental, all the health system is a free. Patients don't have to pay even one cent even if they stay in the hospital for forever, one year, two years. And we don't have this the disconnect the airway, and we have patients stayed on the airway for seven months. It's all the entire health system in Iraq is free, and it's paid by the government. We have a private hospital, but it's for rich people. If you went to the private hospital, you're gonna get the same surface in the governmental hospital. But it's free, so when nurses need to move, they can just, made a concern for the Minister of Health and they can get moved to a to place where they would love to work. So we cannot force and those nurses who l love or their specialty in the, for, in the ICU, the intensive care unit, they love to work there but they, have, they are having extreme trauma because their number and the challenge of the circumstances in these units. Here's a new picture, our friends send it to us. See those nurses, see the nurse that's holding her hand, waving her hand, just say please. By the way, sometimes in, in the, we call it 
the western part from Iraq, which is now infected by ISIS. Those nurses can be arrested just to treat the extremists. Nurses can face a physical violence. You can see these, the views of the blood, the... Uh, by the way, n those three extremists, has, they are taking the opportunity of the love in all the people, because see those people, when someone injured, I told you earlier, Hunter is going to help. You, this, nowadays, they put two bombs. They blow one, and they wait for the second. And two people come to rescue, so they will get killed more numbers. But people don't care. And this is having more than hundreds. They kill, for example, they blow, sometimes they blow bombs for nothing. But when people come, they blow the second. And sometimes we don't have enough ambulances to rescue people. So when you see, uh, for example, victims, people trying to rescue them by their car. We try to uh, select a more gentle picture. Nurses always seeing separated body parts and they, without knowing who they belong to, and put yourself in their shoes and see what kind of trauma, what kind of internal feeling you can have. This is PTSD. After you experience the trauma, this is the symptom can be emerged. But there's certain ways to overcome the trauma effects by experiencing different kind of you know, take, you know, taking medications or anti-anxieties, sed sedations, or trying some psychotherapy, uh, meditation, or yoga. This is a fact, you know, a fact that can help in experiencing the trauma. Or if someone refused or not to manage the trauma, can be admitted to the hospital. But the problem is. What's after the trauma, if the trauma continues? What's happened if the tornado visits every day? What kind of trauma? And this is the international version. This is kind of behavioral changes in a different life circumstances, work, home, and every place you can see. And definitely, as a nurse, we, we have seen all these kind of views. Here is after we experience the behavioral change, it's developed to be like withdrawn from the community and we use the alcohol, excessive alcohol drink and some of these drugs. It's make us isolated from the community and then it's lead us to a depression. And finally, it head us to the suicide. But that was with the international version. With this version, you may see with this kind of violence, Iraq still living the situation and working in the hospital or in the educational setting. But that does not mean nurses in Iraq don't have a PTSD. We said, what do you expect? And I think you expect some of you expect suicide because it's the last destination, right? But in fact, none of them. And I told you it's not mean that nurses, does not, uh, nurses don't have a PTSD. But the PTSD usually usually shown after the stress gone. But the stress is still on nurses. That's why they don't differentiate what's, what's, whether it's a stress or it's a PTSD. But for me, I worked in the psychiatric unit, and most of the nurses come to me and they don't say that. Oh, by the way, I used to, you know, I told you I live in the different, I live in a different states, so I have, I had a room inside the psychiatric unit, because whenever the nurses cannot come to the psychiatric unit, I take their role, 
because I always stay in the units every week. I go to the home every other week. So I have the time to stay and substitute, at least to support them when they cannot come. When, because whenever there is a blood bomb, they cut, you know, they cut the streets because they don't want to control. And this is the only way they, the police can do. So I substitute during the night shifts. They come to me and they ask and they describe the symptom and they usually say, my friend have the symptom. Well, I know from their experience, when they are experiencing the trauma, the flashback, they usually told they see, for example, someone killing others. It's simple and easy for psychiatric nurse to, dis to describe whether they are experiencing the trauma right now when they describe it. So I have seen more than, let's say, 10% from the nurses in my hospital experience the trauma, but they don't tell. First, because the stress, they don't differentiate, and it's a stigma. In my culture, it's a stigma, social stigma, to say, I have a PTSD or I have a psychiatric symptoms. Second, they don't want to lose their job. For example, if I am the nurse manager, and if I have a, a nurse with a PTSD, I definitely don't want him or don't want her to work with patients, because I don't trust someone with a psychiatric disease to work with patients. They don't tolerate patients. They might set them to make errors. So they don't want to lose their job. And there is other circumstances here. See those nurses, despite whatever they face every day, they're still working in the education, in the health settings. They don't care, and they go to the job every day. Here's the important things. No suicidal behavior have been reported since the 2003 when the war and the terrorism start. And no alcohol addiction. And these both, alcohol and suicide, it's not something, uh, let's say it's related to the cultural and uh, religious. It's not allowed for us, suicide. Here, for example, in the United States, I have learned so many things from my friends, American nurses. They explained to me the rules here to give the patient the right to die the, euthanasia, the uh, euthanasia, but in our culture this is not acceptable, and the nurse, every, the patient does not have the right to decide whether they need to die or not. And it's ethically, morally, religiously, culturally, it's refused. Even the alcohol, this is something always religiously and culturally, so it's not available everywhere, but people can get it, alcohol but it's refused by the religious and the government, so we cannot find, especially with nurses, they don't use it. No social, no social isolation, because I told you, nurses expected to work. If they become isolated, they cannot work. They force themselves, and they impose additional challenges and stress and negative outcome on their families to manage. And I've seen so many nurses separated from their families because they wanted to save them life, they left their family and the hospital gave them a room in the hospital just, you know, they're happy. The hospital, they don't care about you. They want you to care for the patients and stay in the hospital. They give you a room. But there is a dangerous and there is a critical things we're seeing in the, among the nurses' work, which is low percentage of sentism has been. Here is a shield of the trauma and how it's affect and how, how it's affect and how nurses can deal. This is the resiliency on the adaptation of nursing with the trauma exposed on them. And by the way, the upcoming strategies were identified through we made it through the Iraq Nursing Syndicate or we called Iraq Nursing Association. We made a uh, survey what makes you, the question, the general question was what makes you uh, what experience the, your work despite the threats? And their answer was ranked this way. First, their faith in God and the destiny. And they usually say God is the only creator. And he says your day is picked and marked. No one can end your day against your destiny. So their faith. The second, nurses say our people need our help because if I don't work, 
my son, my father, my brother might be a one of the victims. So who is going to take care of, if I leave the hospital and the other leave, who is going to take care of my father? And here's a picture represent that trauma no more affect the nurses, like the desert planet. Trauma become an integral part of them, their life. Here's the economic part, which is they need salary to manage their life. Here's one of the uh, ethical and professional commitment nurses say, nurses is my identity, and this, which is good. And the second one said, what pushed me to do my job was my responsibility and duty toward my people. I would be satisfied if I was killed doing my job because it is an honor. By the way, no one can save or protect the life, even if you're in home, no one can guarantee your life because it's bombing everywhere. People don't come to you and say, we're gonna fight you. They usually send bomb, uh, everywhere you cannot imagine, or you know, assassinate people. And here's the, la the last things people say. If we stay home, and the main goal of those extremists is to end the life of people and to create a new country for themselves. So we're going to fight from our, our part, which is working and doing our duty and managing our people. At least if we win, that's we are the part from winning. It's not the people who say, who leave the country when the country need them the most. And here is a say, one of my classmates says, here is a quote in, in the United States, if you rescue one, you are a hero, and if you rescue 100, you are a nurse. I say the Iraqi version is, if you rescue 100, you are a hero, and if you rescue 1,000, you are a nurse. <laughs> and by the way, this is not the end of story. You know, in June 2014, we, and after 2007, we say that we done with terrorism and no more terrorism. In June 2014, the terrorism came to Iraq and took small parts from Iraq, and now they're starting to send bombing more than what they did in, from 2003 to 2007. So nurses still ongoing serve for safety and healing. And thank you so much. To help in different ways, different disciplining culture. For example, we, when we came, so many people trying to shake, especially females trying to shake hands, and in fact we did not shake. And this is not related to you. This isn't related to us. We are not permitted or allowed to shake any woman's hand. It's not related to you. Nothing, but it's for us. It's religious and culturally not to shake any woman's hand. We shake men's hand but we don't shake women's hands. And also the females shake females' hands, they don't shake males' hands. And males kiss males, and females kiss females. So this is the culture of the new things. So please, if you have any question regarding the 70%, you were surprised to see 70% male. And we had more than 80% male. But because now we closed the high school of nursing, we had the high school of nursing, I was lucky because I was the one of students of high school of nursing. But because we need more nurses, we stopped high school of nurses and for, for just males. And it's not fair, but this is okay. Because we need more female nurses. So we create a room for female nurses to increase the number. That's why now we have 25% females while 75% male. I think I have two questions. One, um, we believe nursing when we learn here about the theory of caring and the theory of caring usually has to do with the, with touch so we feel it's a respectful thing to do to touch someone to let them know that we care and so I think that's very interesting that exactly. you, you would, would bring that up because if I understand it correctly 
it would be disrespectful for you exactly. to touch a female or shake her hand. So when we are caring here in the United States, caring for uh, either someone from Iraq or someone that's Muslim because they don't necessarily have to be from Iraq, what few things should we know as nurses on the best way to care for them? Are there like three or four things we should definitely know? Um, thank you for um, sharing uh, about your question, uh, Dr. Smith, about this. This is really a huge in terms of explaining what's going on in terms of providing competent care. Uh, if you are in a situation that you are assigned to take care of a Muslim patient, uh, it's really preferred and it's required to assign female nurse to a, a, patient, a patient who is a female and of course a male, a male uh, nurse to a male uh, patient and, and that's, that's something we are trying to, uh, actually we are doing. We have separated uh, wards in hospitals for female only and male uh, only. So that's the norm, that's the way to respect the religion and to respect the culture. But uh, there is, as you can see here, that the uh, nursing shortage imposes some challenges here. According to the religion and according to the culture, it's okay to provide care when there is no one to provide care. So how you are going to deal with this? You need to do that. So there is some exception here. So you, you can, as a female nurse, take care of a, a female or opposite gender, but with, with, with certain limitation by keeping the privacy of uh, uh, the patient uh, uh, by doing that cautiously and of course uh, uh, privacy is that something we share all across the culture, across the nationalities. Uh, beside that of course uh, I believe uh, uh, beside touch I think uh, some, some in terms of dietary approach, in terms of uh, respecting culture according to our religion we share this with Jewish people we don't uh, allow to eat any pork related products so that's something you need to consider when provide care for a Muslim uh, patient during hospitalization we are not allowed to uh, eat any kind of uh, uh, pork products whether whether meat or uh, uh, the oils that used for cooking that's 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 something in my mind yeah, also yeah by the way uh, it's uh, always exceptional uh, you see, you saw that 25 percent are female, but they don't work at night at the night shift. You can find from those 25 percent, you can find more than less than five percent working the night shift. Sometimes, even we have a separated units. This is even if, if this psychiatry, this is for female and this is for male. Totally separate their facilities, their nurses, they all. But sometimes we don't have enough female nurses, so we work, but with some behavior, so we assume some, at least to keep one nurse, one female nurse with us. Or sometimes we need, for example, Foley's catheters. It's a big challenge for male to do a Foley's catheter. In my hospital, when I was in the medical city, it has 1,000 bed, approximately 1,000. We had one. We had nurses working in the uh, delivery room. We have nurses working in the spaces when we need you female, but they cannot leave their units. They are in their units, and they sign the contract. We don't leave. We work at night because this is no one can work in the delivery room. But we don't leave the room, even if they need food. They call and they send, the food comes to them. But we had one nurse in the entire hospital. We call if we need help. But we usually work with female. We try to maintain the privacy by opening the door and waiting. And usually patients allowed with, covered. with yeah, covered and allowed with, uh, with a uh, relative. So, and it's not allowed for female to expose herself on males or the opposite. By the way, it's not all the country like this way. We have uh, mixed culture. We have more than five religions in Iraq. We have a Muslim, the majority, we have Christian, uh, the, the largest minority, and we have Isidian, those belief, and we have uh, people believe in Satan, we have people don't believe, we have different kind of religion, and that's why this is the, the, what's going on in Iraq, because it's, you know, those extremists take the opportunity of the diversity, 
And we have a different, even regarding the religion, we have a different culture. You can see people like you see here in, in Oklahoma or in the United States. And you, when you go to my city, it's a, called a religious build. You cannot see even female without a veil, I mean the scarf, or called abaya, which covers the body. While when you go to Baghdad, you can see like you are here. Yeah. You cannot different yourself from people here in the United States. So there is an exception. Um, this is we we are trying to manage the by increasing the number of nursing schools, and it's now about how many? Nurses? About 11, 11, 11 while for five years there was just three. Yes, I have something to add to that, if it's okay. I think what um, our sister was talking about is we're taught here that um, like touch is therapeutic and that we're supposed to be used to touch to help our patients feel better. Yes, yes, and so I think she was asking about that, but the, I'm Muslim too, my family's from Jordan. And I think that what we, the culture differences is, like he was saying, five, like 500 people will run for one person that's hurt. They have a more collective culture in exactly. the Middle East. So family members are constantly present at the bedside. Yes, a person exactly. is never alone. Expected so that. the patients don't have that need for the therapeutic touch in that society, the way that yes, patients here have it. So it's not yes. that much of a, a problem. Exactly. You, you just describe it in, yes, in your way. You. Uh, we, we believe that. Yes, we are a collective uh, society, and in terms of touch, therapeutic touch is, is something that we totally respect, and uh, we believe it in uh, gender uh, touch is, is okay, male to male, female to female, but uh, when a, a female who is a stranger, not my wife, not my uh, sister, touch me, that's going to break the atmosphere of spirituality, so this is different. And there's not a, a need for it, is uh -huh. what I was saying, because normally the family is there and they're yes, not the one who's doing stuff, so the nurses don't have to fill that gap exactly. as much exactly. as we do here. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Of course, ma'am, please. Um, I was a nurse for many years, but now I'm a counseling student. And what I'm interested in is do you think that when the war ends, because I'm assuming at some point it's going to do. Yes, ma'am. That the nurses will then suffer post-traumatic stress. I mean, I worked in an ICU for years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the trauma that came through there was sometimes very, very horrifying. And nothing like what you guys experienced, constant barrage. Mm -hmm. But I know some of the nurses I worked with had PTSD. And I was just curious if you think that might happen once the trauma's over, once it, you know, stops First, or you get more nurses or... Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, hopefully uh, the end or, or the cycle of trauma is going to uh, stop soon. That's, that's our hope. Uh, I, I believe, and there's evidence that support that uh, once the trauma stops, we expect kind of pandemic PTSD. However, as Hydra explained, and this is a, a research that we did recently in our school, that this, these special two shields, which is faith-based hope and ethical and com uh, professional commitments are those shields that even at, after the end of the trauma, we rely on these kind of shields to continue with those people, those shields uh, help them during the crisis, and we believe the effect or the uh, the help that this shield, according to our description in this research, which is which was based on Iraqi nurses' expressions, we believe that's also the this this kind of uh, defense mechanisms will continue with them even after the trauma. However, I'm not assuming that uh, it's going to be a, a general. Uh, uh, direction. I expect that some people will suffer after this trauma, and uh, some people, by the way, decided that we are not going to stay at Iraq. And we can, you can check the rates of immigration in my country because some people uh, may not be armed with this kind of uh, strong uh, uh, and courage to move on. So they decided that we are not going to continue in this country. So they left the country. So. It depends on the person 
But you are expecting some inoculation against COVID. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. In fact, the, the <coughs> negative outcome of the PTSD symptoms emerge after the trauma gap. Right. While you're under the stress, you don't feel like the, when you st someone stabbed by a knife, you don't see blood until you move the knife. So this is what's happened with the PTSD. This is the negative impact or the negative outcome. It's there, but they don't feel it because they're confused with the symptoms. Until the, where the trauma comes and where they see themselves, they are not moving toward the good end, and they're still with the symptoms, then they will describe themselves as a PTSD victim. Okay, I was just curious. I work with American vets, and 